I traced the indentations on my right cheek and temple. I examined my fingertips for evidence of blood. Then I checked again with the care of a braille reader. Nothing. Have you finished? William Wong called to me from the control room door. I didn't turn. My watch signaled ten minutes to nine. I could hear the deliberate rustling of papers in the adjoining offices, a typical morning flurry from those who were trying to camouflage their late coming. Finished, huh? I spun the editing sweet chair around on its rollers and faced Wong. Good. I could probably get out of the building without attracting attention. I breathed out and easy. Finished, William? He nodded and stepped aside for me. I passed through the offices, simulating an absorbed interest in contents of the notebook I was carrying. I only had to get to the stairway and I'd be all right. I was nearer to praying than I ever had been, that no one would speak to me. I couldn't have borne a word, even a gesture. The back of my skull, on either side, between ear and hairline, was throbbing, a stabbing reminder that I'd seen too much. More than anyone should ever have seen. Working conditions at NPB were thoroughly unsavoury. It was small comfort to me that I was assured time and time again that NPB was the exception in Singapore. There was certainly a purge going on, and even a video consultant was not immune. Happily, in between my spells of consultative and production work, I was able to get around and observe this steadfast island nation etching its future under the astute guidance of Lee Kuan Yew. But I doubt that even the redoubtable Mr. Lee could have kept an eye on all Singapore's civil servants. I was sure, at any rate, that he couldn't have been aware of what the executive director of the NPB was inflicting on his personnel. The staff I had most to do with were financially bonded, so they could do nothing to defend themselves. Rather like Russians, uh, Czechs and Poles I've known, they survived through jokes. A funny story session would erupt, instantly throwing off the gloom. The ambiance would switch from leaden despondency to hysterical delight, and then back again. So as not to be part and parcel of the uh, no-win atmosphere of NPB, I instituted a special working pattern for myself. I'd go to the studio at 5 a.m., finish at 9 a.m., return at 7 p.m., and leave off at about 11 p.m. I also spent much of the weekend there. That way I didn't have to bear witness to those of the caliber of Tan Siu Yang and Rosli Bin Ottman, to name but two, suffering abuse. The security guards got used to me after a while. I'd arrive with my thermos and some homemade sandwiches, ride up to the sixth floor, pass along the tobacco and refuse stinking corridors. Odd, I hardly ever saw anyone smoking at NPB and entered the video center using four keys, including those for the alarm systems. I'd made sure I wouldn't have to oblige a technician to turn up at the unthinkable, for Singaporeans, hour of 5 a.m. by accustoming myself to operating all the necessary controls in the editing suite and all the light, camera, sound, monitor, chroma key, and so on equipment and facilities, including linkages. I didn't do this for self-achievement. I considered most technical activity a nuisance, a disturber of concentration during the creative process, but, well, merely as a matter of expediency. I was, therefore, virtually a one-man studio. From the moment of entering and locking myself in, I was absolute master of my universe. I could bring together all the vision and sound I desired. You need footage, I can hear some of you saying. True. But if I hadn't any, I went and got it. You can be sure I was completely self-contained. Given time and patience, and a lot of patience is needed in this game, I could achieve anything I wanted. What I actually had to do for NPB was relatively simple. I could have done far less had I wished, for NPB were not interested in artistic refinements. In fact, I opted for a more creative logo than needed and set to work with the following plan in mind. I'd have A, black space, followed by B, materializing stars, 
followed by C, one growing star transposing into a moon-sized orb, D, enlarging, E, becoming planet Earth, F, approaching with a green diamond shape appearing on the planet's surface, G, turning into the island of Singapore, H, out of which would blow up the letters NPB. After a few days, I had achieved this, but to a modest degree, not wishing to draw NPB's attention to the time-consuming factor. One item particularly had taken me hours to finish. I had to spin a cutout of planet Earth, run over to camera, shoot and zoom, and all that after having dashed into the control room to release pause and go into record. Unfortunately, they had no remote controls at NPB, among other things. Well, now I was ready to mix in sound. William Walton's first symphony. I patched the audio cassette line in, set my pre-roll video at minus five, and away she went. Audio inset work is easy. Since all filming can be called optical illusion, the last thing one expects while engaged in this sort of work is uh, an optical illusion. As Walton's blazing brass zoomed the viewer into a head-on collision with Earth, I saw that something was not as it should have been. I went straight to black. I checked my source tape. Okay. Patch jacks. Uh -huh. Entry point. Yes, yeah, all right. No A and B roll, so that was okay. Uh, finally, I checked the master. Mm -hmm. The dropout was where it should be. No loss of signal, otherwise. Well, I set my entry point one frame back, reset my audio together with source tape on player one. I set pre-roll at minus seven just in case. And we were off. There it was again. I went to black. I prefer that to setting an exit point. I rolled back to E, the dissolve point from luminous orb to planet Earth. There was no question about it. It was a reflection of myself, which I, I must have inadvertently brought in when playing around with two cameras, one of which was shooting into the monitor and the other was feeding through chroma key. From what I could discern, my shape could be seen from behind in a crouching position as planet Earth arrived at close-up. I supposed I must have crouched while fiddling around with something or other, and possibly one camera I'd set in motion had shot a back view of me reflected in the monitor. Well, it wasn't so bad. Just needed a new cut-in on source tape a little further back. That was all. I then could settle the whole thing with a video insert. About an hour later, I'd finished and set up the audio again for a drop-in. Off we went. Happened again. It happened. As planet Earth came into a close up in a slow, dolly effect, the planet seemed to partially dissolve of its own accord. And I could see myself crouching in a loose shot, obviously bending over something and looking into it. I imagined it to be the monitor. But what was now soaking my clothes? in spite of the studio air conditioning unit I'd switched on, was that the planet Earth had dissolved completely into my crouching form. The camera appeared to be closing in, gradually moving over my left shoulder and bringing into frame what I, in the monitor, was peering into. I was transfixed. This was not what I had shot. I, I couldn't have done. My legs were actually trembling. Something had happened to the music. It was no longer Walton. As the camera closed in, I saw that I, in the shot I'd somehow taken, and yet could not have taken, was peering into a microscope. Gripping the padded edge of the editing desk, I tried to push myself up and away from the unit. My wet palms slipped about on the leathery surface, and my 
thigh muscles wouldn't function. The music was... Monsieur? Oh. Who then? What? As the camera moved in, squeezing between my left eye and the microscope lens, and then framing only the lens itself, the cataclysmic strains became known to me. It was Tezo Matsimuro's second piano concerto, a work of colossal climactic force and ethereal tension. The camera moved on down into the lens as the trilling piano treble, accompanied by its bass single note triad, blended with the newly menacing other strings. I saw my planet Earth shot again, and yet not again. The zoom in was fast. The planet's colouring was somehow more blatant. I, the viewer, was being propelled towards Earth. And there was my green diamond, which I had, in fact, abandoned, transmuting into Singapore Island. I was being hurled down towards the island into the square bladed daggers of the city's skyscrapers and down and down through its walls and ceilings and as Matsumuro's trumpets and trombones snarled and bayed and as his strings seared into a yawning roar of timpani I saw the figure of a man As you now do. And as we, the camera and I, went down once more past the back of my own skull into the microscope lens, I was aware of the upper portion of my body keeling over onto the controls. through to the swing doors leading to the stairs. Here the smoke and garbage stench was replaced by something more fish and fruit-like. I eased off a little. I knew I'd meet no one walking up a Singapore stairway in nearly 30 degrees. I halted, gripping a handrail as I felt a slight vertigo. Where was I going anyway? I stepped out of the cuppage centre into that familiar, although hotter than usual, it seemed, soft slap of humid heat. Ranging between 24 and 31 degrees, as the radio announcer would say, just about every day of the year, in that not quite correct Singlish. For a thankful moment, I was back in yesterday at nine in the morning's world, wandering between the city's green lungs along its pavements where the endless varieties of dress and costume, ancient and modern, and the faces of every race imaginable constantly entertained the eye. I tried to hold on to yesterday. Yesterday had received no death sentence. Yesterday I had been in control. Today, what I had long dreaded, had come about. I had until seven o'clock that very evening before going back to the studio. The tapes would be there, waiting for me. I went to strollers for breakfast. Luckily, most of the straggling tourists crowded into Singapore's, unluckily numerous, junk food joints. Strollers was in its own class. I burrowed into a copy of the Straits Times, a truly readable newspaper, losing myself for some moments. A tap on my shoulder, and Paul Siao was leaning over me. I invited him for a coffee. He had half an hour to spare from his Singapore Broadcasting Corporation activities, having been on an errand to the Beethoven record shop at Centrepoint. He'd headed for strollers on the off chance of meeting me, he said. Fortunately, I was able by now to distinguish him from his twin brother Peter on sight, but I'd been had by one or the other of them on several occasions. 
we launched right away into one of our discussions, you know, classical tenors, baritones, and so on. I took the line that there had hardly been a voice of caliber, just screamers, since Caruso and Gidi, and he argued that latter-day acoustics revealed flaws which were not evident in the olden times. About three-quarters of an hour later, when Paul had gone, I was unable to get back into the newspaper. I contemplated quitting Singapore. I mentally checked my account. I could get to Ottawa, where I had had a job offer from a Swedish company. No, by the time I'd paid my dues in Singapore, and foregoing any further salary coming to me, of course, and what with uh, apartment installation in Ottawa at an initial $600 per month, it would be tricky. I could get my fare back to Zimbabwe, paid by, kindly paid by, Toby Brook, who lived in Harare. But the job situation there was grim, among other things. Well, there was my squash partner, Roger Saib, in Tehran. He had many connections and lots of ideas. Uh, but I wondered how the Khomeini crew looked upon the likes of freewheeling, free-dealing Saib right now. Saib, when I knew him, would use his desk at the Bank Melli in Ferdosi Avenue merely to lean upon while awaiting a squash game with little Mosafari and a gardener employed by the same bank and champion of the Near East, incidentally. All three possibilities were backwards ones. Not attractive. I wasn't going anywhere. A few days away from the studio? Where? Sentosa? Desaru? Jakarta? Kuala Lumpur? Uh, I paid my bill at strollers and then looked for an orange phone. Rada answered on the first ring. That, if nothing else, made her different to most other telephone answerers in Singapore. How nice to hear from you. Rada did not speak Singlish. Her voice was as cultured as that of the Prince of Wales. She came originally from the north of Malaya. One could easily take her to be a Tamil or southern Indian, as her skin was darker than most Malays. She was averagely attractive in Singapore terms, but her electric personality and pensive black eyes, together with her penchant for appearing on the scene in a marvellous variety of saris, caftans, chic dresses and executive business suits with hair up, down, sideways, in plaits, ponytails, chignons, <laughs> what a show! definitely gave her the edge over most women. I asked her if she was free for the next few days. The next few days? Have you abandoned NPB? No, I just need a rest from it. Before you propose anything, I'd better mention that my brother-in-law, or rather my ex-brother-in-law and his wife, are coming to spend a couple of weeks in Singapore. Oh. But that's only tomorrow morning. Ah, she laughed. Would you like to come over? I got out at Geylang Road. I always tipped. It was a matter of principle for me. The taxis were cheap, air-conditioned, and no tipping was the Singaporean rule. The majority of the drivers were self-disciplined, as were most Singaporeans, it seemed to me. And the police were severe and correct, as I had uh, witnessed more than once. And that helped. Although Rada lived in Siglap Road, and not in Geylang, I'd decided to foot the rest and give myself a chance to prepare my role. Rada was no fool. She knew I needed to see her. She was going to offer me comfort. She was going to make me happy. For a while. She probably viewed me as a much-traveled, somewhat disorientated Westerner. She was practical. Too busy to concern herself with the fripperies of things philosophical. By profession, a journalist. She'd separated from her husband because he was too small for her, as she put it. I suspected he uh, treated her in a rather typically uh, male-female manner, and she wouldn't put up with it. How would she view the experience I'd just had if I related it to her? Hmm. I concluded that she would be very uncomfortable. I wasn't going to tell her. My role would be uh, yesterday's me, not today's. Turning into Siglap Road, I checked my evening's script, so to speak. I'd have to do some filtering. 
down-to-earth Rada might be, but uh, that wouldn't prevent her from pursuing a point even all the way into the abstract, should her curiosity be aroused. I spent much of the following day wandering around in the botanic gardens, sometimes remembering the consolation of Rada. If my script was excellent, hers had been perfect. And sometimes preparing myself for my seven o'clock rendezvous with a videotape. I glided with black swans, rode with snapping turtles on sundry planks in the silken lake, idled on endless lawns and scanned water lily ponds for their secrets. But I knew there were to be no more secrets. I'd been vaguely gazing at a bush for a while when it, or most of it anyway, transformed itself into a boy, leaping into life, pirouetting prankishly and cackling with joy. <laughs> Had he been looking at me? Had he wondered if I had detected his disguise? I searched for him afterwards to see if he was still playing bushes, but he was not to be found. I had lunch at the sleepy little gardens cafe and then strolled through dense jungle-like undergrowth, panning multicoloured shrubs in bloom and occasional giant conifers. Spinning outwards from time to time, I saw my figure as in a long shot longing to have lain hand in hand with Radha, penned upon a sweep of lawn, two strokes of a brush on a sure canvas, a canvas surer than a word, which with but one letter removed becomes nothing. I was glad Su Yang was still there when I arrived at seven in the evening. She had, she told me with a tired sigh, been trying to finish the narration of her slide program. She asked me if I had completed my logo. More or less. May I see it? Oh, why not? I said. But the casual tone was wasted on Su Yang. She would not speculate on whether I was masking one thing by saying another. If I said, uh, would you mind passing me that object, please? Su Yang heard, pass that. And inversely, if she said, pass that, I was no doubt supposed to hear, would you mind passing me that object? The problem was all mine. I had the uh, cultural expectations. She merely expected the object in question. Neither would she have noticed that my hands were trembling as I loaded the master tape. In her eyes, I was there to teach, and she would learn. She was simply privileged to view the expert at work. Although only in her early twenties, Su Yang was no mere pretty young thing. Apart from being a level-headed and determined producer, she was probably more reliable than the majority of her colleagues, notwithstanding her cynical view of the NPB director's attitude towards his staff. I sat nearer to the monitor than Su Yang so that she wouldn't be able to see my face during the tape run. There was no point in my looking at hers anyhow, whatever she thought if it were in any way uncomplimentary, wouldn't show. If she were favourably impressed, a monosyllabic reaction was the most one could expect. Blank space to stars, to star growing, to orb approaching, to planet Earth. Stop. No self crouching over a microscope. No self sucked down and forced through a metallic tunnel into outer space, into planet Earth, through the city's walls, down to that figure, myself again, at the microscope. The music was Walton's again. I, I laughed, released. What's so funny? I turned to Sue Young. How self-contradictory that Americanism from correct little Sui Yang. I didn't reply. She would not persist. I like it, she said, not mentioning that it was not complete. She nodded and then stood. I'm tired now. I will go home. After she'd gone, I used a space shot of Singapore Island, dissolving it into a geographic one to round off. I sat back, having checked the finished logo. 
Not quite what I planned, but well, at least there were no complications. <laughs> complications? That was quite an understatement. I tilted back and rested my crossed feet, sacrilegiously, on the padded edge of the editor. It had, then, been my imagination. And, of course, my imagination, being a filmmaker, had to be richer than the imagination of the ordinary mortal. Or had it been the sign of an approaching illness or madness <laughs> not likely I'd stay with imagination a dialogue started up they had been on the increase of late my dialogues of course I, I knew them to be dialogues of myself and none other this one began with a laugh and um, but what is imagination what is it um, yeah, page 284 yeah, yeah, yeah. the little Oxford dictionary Imagination, mental faculty, forming images of objects not present to senses. Creative faculty of mind. Forming images of objects not present to senses. But I had rerun the tape twice. And I had noted the minutes, seconds and frames of each in and out point. Overcautiously, some might say. But at each run-through, the timings had been identical. That's, That's remarkably, remarkably thorough, thorough of, you. of you. Unbelievably, Unbelievably thorough. thorough. Nevertheless, I did, particularly as I was editing alone. Very, Very well, well, if you, you insist. insist. Then what do you make of that? Well, well, hyperactive imagination, imagination, a sign of boredom and unfulfillment. Amusing. How about a serious answer? All right. Remember Mexico, 1964? Yes. Gertie and Hans Dieter Preuss. And during one of those philosophical sessions, Gertie asked, uh, Then why are we here? And you answered, The answer lies in the question. And Gertie said, What do you mean? And you said, I haven't the slightest idea. It was true. I hadn't. But you, but you looked, looked for handsome Gertie, Gertie later, later, didn't you? Because you found out what, what you'd you meant. meant. True. I even looked for them last year when I was in Stuttgart. But not necessarily to tell them anything. After all, the subject might have been quite unwelcome to them. All right. But at least to find out if they had given it more thought. Yes. But what does that to do with this conversation? Oh. I'm beginning to see the connection. Admit it. You were in a mess at the time. You were trying to force out, or at any rate to ignore, the findings of your own mind. Your private life was falling all over the place, and you were beginning to prance about like a scared chicken. Yes, and I did a lot of that for the next six or seven years. Yes. And then, around 1970, you began to have a notion of what was going on, but you put it aside. Why? Too much of a bother. I'm no intellectual. Had you been one, you wouldn't have uh, seen what you saw yesterday morning. I'm, uh, I'm stuck with it, then. More. You've got, got a to deal, deal with it. Now's the time. time. Passing the resplendent doorman of the Ming Court Hotel in long black tunic over black trousers embroidered in sequins. Had he worn that uniform before? We must have provided him with quite a wardrobe. I entered the inner courtyard. A glass roof with jade shaded tiles topped an arcade like structure. Daylight through the roof illuminated a fountain at its center. I had a nice choice of seats. Uh, this was not the prime time for Singapore, insofar as tourists were concerned, and uh, took one with the best overall view of both the lobby and the shopping area. I ordered Chinese seafood steamboat, 
far too much for one, which would consist of chafing dish with simmering bouillon, individual plates containing raw seafood such as king prawns, oysters, sundry fish and scallops, all to be cooked in the bouillon at will with side dishes of rice and stir-fried vegetables. I kept the menu, wanting to browse over the rest of it. There were so many items I hadn't yet tried. One could spend years in Singapore getting to know its stupendous variety of cuisine. While reading the menu, I had more or less eased into a daydream. I, I was aware that my eyes had remained on one item, in fact a single word, but that I was elsewhere. As I refocused on what I was reading, drawing myself back from the dream, I realized that I didn't understand the word. It definitely was English, because it was uh, in the middle of a normal English phrase. The word was ibs. Ibs? I, I worried about it for a while. Was it technical? A special culinary term? I was feeling uncomfortable. I, I couldn't imagine why it should bother me, but bother me it did. Ibs. I, I'd understood every other word on the menu, except the non-English ones, of course, which showed themselves quite clearly. So, so why not this one? And anyway, why this fixation? I wasn't interested in words per se, so what was all the fuss? And then I almost blushed. I felt an itchy prickle of light perspiration as I realized that it was a, a mere printing error. The word was ribs. Almost as soon as I had shamefacedly reasoned it out, I noticed something else. The R was not missing from the word ribs. I tilted up abruptly. A patient waiter was there, dishes balanced along his arms. For how long? With an expressionless smile, the young Chinese lowered the plates, tidied, and veered away. I had badly bent one side of the menu. I looked at the word again. Phrases came to me <laughs> indiscriminately. Remove a letter from a word and it becomes nothing. You're never alone in Singapore because there's always someone who wants to sell something to you. In Singapore, anything can happen. All things can happen. Vocabulary is the mask that hides no face. <laughs> Idiot thought. I reached into the food, summoning an appetite that had all but dissipated. I forced my attention onto it. I switched to macro, filling my frame with nothing but the food and the consuming of it. Black. I will. Black. I did it now. I did it now. Where I was, who I was, what I was. It lasted all my life.
cleared Singapore. I rushed into myself. Substance and color poured upon me, flooding my canvas with light. My painting, mine. My canvas could only either be full or empty. Nothing is between. Dreams could be so absurd. <laughs> in the last dream, I'd been an actor at a West End theatre in London with an important role. Uh, I, I strode across the stage with, with the powerful sense of audience, of, of presence, of moment. I seized the actress, uh, what was her name, uh, Jennifer, uh, by her upper arms and, and clumsily kissed her. Uh, her response was all enveloping. Uh, caught in her kiss... I panicked. They would know. They would know that this was not merely a stage kiss. Her lips encircled me in a quivering, cool witness. I was drowning, ready to let go and sink into her softness. I had to prove that this was all part of the act and nothing more. I tried to pull away, but she had intertwined her fingers and locked her arms around my waist. This could not go on. The audience would storm the stage. I looked down. My feet were slipping. I shifted them. They left the floor. I did not fall. The air was wet and warm, but clouded. I heard slithering. I looked up. Her mouth was no longer over mine, but far, yet kissing still. What was it, kissing or sucking? I reached out. My fingers stirred a rustling, whispering scream. Her mouth was arched in a call I could not, I knew, resist. Woolly walls sucked me in, dumbing me to her. She was drawing me back to death. I was being de-lifed. I wanted it. Oh, how I wanted it. It would end this idiocy, this crass and putrid farce, this fetid fantasy. No! I must resist. I would prove I could resist. I should, I should prove I was the stronger, the strongest. Prove I was in control. Prove I was alive. I reached into that now liquid air and tearing at that now silken wall, clawed it all apart. I stood soaked but freed. <laughs> actress, though boarding herself against the theatre set's mantelpiece, was watching me, trying to wipe away the white slivers of plasticky stuff hanging from her lips. I turned to the audience, whom I could not see, of course, because of the spots, and shouted, You, you see, see not, not dead, dead but, but alive. alive. You, you thought, thought I, I was dead, dead didn't, didn't you? you? Well, well, I'm not. not. You, you thought I wouldn't, wouldn't triumph, but, but I, I did. did. You, you thought, thought I, I would give in, but, but I didn't. didn't. Perhaps, Perhaps well, you're, you're not, not so, so intelligent, intelligent. yourself. We'll, we'll see. I called to the stage manager. Peter, dimmers and house lights. And there was the audience. A thousand strong, I would say. Each one of them in identical clothing. Each one with an identical face. Mine. Uh, you, you see... see you, you haven't, haven't quite, quite understood. understood. I continued a little more kindly as I saw the face. But, but I'll, I'll help, help you. you. Look, look. I walked over to the actress.
mistress, kneaded her unprotesting cheek and tweaked her sloppy bottom lip. I turned to my viewer. You see? I held my smeared fingers out to them. It's, it's five, five and, and nine and, and carmine. See? I was jubilant now and began in circus showman fashion to prance about the apron. And, and cold, cold cream, cream tel telcum, float, float, and flats, and, flats, and, and wings. wings, and then conspiratorially leaning right out over the footlights, and, and butterflies, butterflies in the tummy, all the throat, the time, throat, the time, the time you fluffed, fluffed and dried, and, and the, the prompt, prompt was doing, doing a crossword, giggles and whispers at the stage door. door. Strutting the stage in declamatory pose. Now, no, my, my co-mates, co brothers, brothers in exile, in exile. these are but, but counselors to persuade, to persuade me, me what, I what I am. am. And what and am what I, ladies and gentlemen? I, I am, am the actor. The actor. The stage. The stage. The audience. The audience. The scenery. The scenery. Shall I pull? Shall it? I prove it? Seeing a nod of affirmation from my watchers, I said, Right, observe. I am the audience. And I snapped my finger and thumb. The audience vanished. I am the stage. Snap, snap. The stage vanished. The scenery, the scenery. No more scenery, no more scenery. The theater, the theater. No theater, no theater. The world. No world. I stood among the stars. I was warned to stop. I could not. The stars! No snap. I'd lost my fingers. I'd lost my body. I'd lost my signal. I'd gone. At Rubber House, there was to be a lecture entitled Pro-Man, Barbara Summers informed me by phone. Coming? I asked her what made her think I'd be interested in any such subject. Oh, you've been around. So have you. And she had. This fragile creature from a rural backwater in Montana had seen a good deal of the world for someone aged only 25. And so I've been around... Why would I be interested in Cro-Magnon? Cro-Man, as if you didn't hear. Okay, I'll come. You're too clever for me. 725, and on the dot. Don't keep a lady waiting in this shady city. Shady city? You're safer in Singapore than any city in the world, as you know perfectly well, you uneducated Englishwoman. I am an American, sir. Precisely. Mr. Joseph Marcel. We loved to puppy quarrel. Often around the same subject, catacresis or the misuse of words. I took the side, naturally, that uh, the Americans mispronounced or misspelled the original English word, then incorporating it into an American language dictionary, called it an American word. She insisted that American was a separate language in its own right. She was petite and witty. Neither of us believed in casual relationships or sex for the sake of enjoying it. We were, rarity of rarities, platonic friends. But we only met to uh, do something, never just to meet. Hence our lasting friendship, I believe. He's an American scientist, but his original degree was in economy, Barbara whispered. Oh, I said, assuming the combination of scientist and economist, had been too tempting to miss. The tall, bald, bespectacled, and slightly stooping man had so far delivered his lecture with great enthusiasm and dynamism. It seemed that man, he apologized very gallantly for the sexist term, 
would be undergoing corpuscular changes through evolutionary, surgical, and other means, and his sensory faculties would adjust accordingly. His um, psychohistorical, I think the term was, perspectives would alter. Eventually, man would have transmuted into pro-man, entirely synthetic man, seen in present-day terms. Pro-man would be all that man used to be, minus emotional reactions and physical death. Man, the species, would have become man, the product. It, pro-man, would probably refer to its ancestors or predecessors as, say, imperfect man or incomplete man. As pro-man continued its programs, it would view its man-born beginnings in much the same way as man now looked back on the metamorphosis of water creature into land creature. Here, the scientist economist benevolently smiled at almost everyone in the audience before saying, Eventually, conscious man will be reviewed as a transitory stage between mindless cosmic essence and pro-man or man as it should be. His affection for his subject was, I could even say, endearing. The man was very, very believable. I saw no harm in his thesis at that moment. I was not put off by any evidence of a politically or ideologically motivated thread, his audience seemed enthralled. Barbara, chin on hand on elevated knee, was still as steel. I managed to peer around without attracting attention. Of course, as you will have understood, without my concept of their attention being attracted. And uh, I saw a marked majority of young people, Chinese, Malays, Tamils, and, well, thank the Lord, Singapore was no western British Columbia, no southern California, no lotus land. The, the, the youngsters in this city nation, you could see, were here to learn, to, to make use of. They were going to govern. The young governors. Our lecturer was now almost delirious. All parts of the body, he beamed, including sections of the brain, will be replaceable. And then with grave emphasis, renewable, yeah. Pro-man will live, or rather, and he made a hush-like motion as though to whisper a secret, or rather, will function as a component in a program evolved by, or well, let us call it, logicalysis. <laughs> That's my word. Barbara nudged me, smiling a you see, at me, presumably referring to the American's own vocabulary. I smiled back paternally. The genial professor went on. In human terms, pro-man will seem mindless, for it will follow its ever-adjusting programs forever. Pro-man will not operate within the context of time, space, galaxy, etc. But according to self-perpetuating programs, all of which will be achievable. The terms purpose, meaning, goal, doubt, will occupy no place in pro-man's mental repertoire, so to speak. Pro-man's functioning will be undeviating and infinite. Machine-like, it will build onto and discard from its body as necessary, according to climatic dictates, wear and tear, and so forth. Here he almost went into a wrestler's crouch, as he said, and just for fun, let us stray into philosophical fields. He straightened up. Outside my domain, true, but so fascinating to contemplate that I can't resist. He returned to his crouch. One could say the pro-man will be spared imperfect man's most aggravating dilemma, for it Pro-man will not be capable of suspecting through an instinctive mode that it is both here and yet not here. Since pro-man will never lose consciousness, i.e. never sleep, it will never be confronted by the humanly perceivable dichotomy, if I am asleep and I wake up, I am alive. If I do not wake up, I am dead. Since I will not be alive, to experience my death, I am already dead, and so on. For pro-man, one could say that existence will last for one day, and night will never come. 
He uncurled himself to his full height in a leisurely way. I peered about me again. A number of the audience seemed uncomfortable. My concept. The impassive politeness of the Singaporean did not seem much in evidence any longer. Was it boredom? I peeped at Barbara. I could see her distress, perhaps bewilderment. After all, it was a heavy subject, in spite of the preamble of a colourful introduction with slides, photos and drawings in an evolutionary perspective. The lecturer ended with um, words to the effect that such a creature presumably would neither have use for time, future, past, nor even present, and then asked if there were any questions. Barbara and I turned right out of Rubber House and immediately right up the stairs above the Bank of America. We took a left, hanged a left, as she might have put it, at the top of the stairs and across the Collier Key overpass known as Change Alley. I, uh, I didn't have a question, she said, but I, I was going to say something. Oh, what? She stopped walking and looked at me mischievously. Oh, I was going to say, thank goodness women aren't involved in this pro-man prognosis. <laughs> but he got in first by apologizing for being sexist. <laughs> you know, mankind and all that. Biddy, it would have got a laugh. We were strolling along Change Alley with its stalls of money changers, watch, camera and electronics vendors, sari clothing stalls and, and one oriental fast food outlet. I doubt it, Barbara reposted. They hardly looked to be in the mood for laughter. Down the escalator now with its plastic roofing and into the harbour terminal area where everything was peddled by everybody 24 hours a day. And finally, up in the lift, or elevator, as Barbara stressed, lauding the relative sophistication of the American word, uh, which took us to the revolving restaurant with its candle-lit interior. I felt that Barbara was going to say more about the lecture, but uh, I didn't want to press her. We ordered Singapore slings, that delightful bright pink gin and grenadine concoction of Raffles Hotel fame, and gazed upon Singapore's glowing city garlanded by sumptuously lighted anchored ships. Uh, well, I was very curious by now about her reaction to the lecture. She fiddled with a chopstick. I'm uh, hoping he's wrong. Why, Barbara, you mean you took him seriously? Very droll. Tell me, future pro-man, do you think he was joking? I should like to remind you, future pro-person, that I am 15 years or so older than you, which could make all the difference as to whether or not it occurs in your lifetime, as opposed to my lifetime. Well, thank you for leaving me to the, uh, to the robotists. Mm, good word. If it uh, <clears throat> hasn't already been used. But in any case, what makes you think it'll happen overnight? What makes us think it'll happen before the bomb? Because, Barbara, I don't believe in the bomb. What? That gave me the biggest laugh of the week. Barbara's honey-blonde curls leapt from her cheeks as she hiccuped on her Singapore sling. What do you mean you don't believe in the bomb? Tracking right. I noticed lighter patches out of focus as faces faded in. Relax, Barbara. You'll make them think we're tourists. Then explain, Mr. Joseph Marcel. She wasn't smiling. Now, this was where age gap couldn't help coming in, I suppose. Freeze frame. Explain. How could I explain? Don't believe in the bomb. What was I doing? Trying to impress her. To joke? My jokes never came off. To provoke her outrage. And why her reaction? It was as though I'd said, I don't believe in love or, or, or morality or something sacred. I pulled back from our table into a wide shot of the freeze. Something sacred. 
something, something, some, S O M, E T H I, E T H I, N N G, something, S, S, Omet, O M E T, H I N G, Hing, S, Omet, Hing, something. Something was identifiable. Something was perceivable. And nothing. I scanned the stone faces of customers caught in ice still flames of candles. Crabbing over to Barbara, I was touched by that pert pout of expectancy etched forever in her features. Forever. If something was perceivable, Nothing had to be perceivable. If something was explainable, nothing had to be explainable. Why I didn't believe in the bomb? What did I mean? What could I say to her? I could say... Could I say it? Uh, uh, Barbara, the bomb is nothing, because if it comes, we are nothing. And then she'd say, yes, but until it comes, we are something. And I'd have to say, but Barbara, imagination has no time constraints. So if you can imagine it's coming, it has already come, or it will never come. And Barbara would say, I don't understand. Why should she have understood? I didn't. Doctor, doctor, I'm having problems understanding what I'm thinking. I'm also having some difficulty fathoming out what I'm saying. Ah, yes, I see. Are you also finding confusion in distinguishing between what is on camera and what is not? Why, yes, and words. Uh, you're having problems with those, aren't you? You find that they become utter nonsense without warning. Why, Doctor, this is incredible. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Now, perhaps there's something else you haven't noticed. Oh, yes. Take a look at your postcard. Postcard? Yes, yes, the one you have of the revolving restaurant and its occupants. Ah, oh, I see you don't care for the word postcard. Very well, let us say photo. All right? Okay. Now, if you look in the direction of your friend Barbara, you'll notice something. Uh, let me see. Uh, well, yes, she looks as though she can't decide whether or not to smile. True. But there's something else. What? Oh. Christ. Yes, interesting, isn't it? Christ. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm I'm not in the picture. Exactly. But why? Why the hell aren't I in the picture? That's easily answered. One can't be in the picture and look at it from the outside at one at the same time. Can one? That's absurd. I've seen myself in photos before, and I've, I've held photos in my hand. But not lie. I beg your pardon? But not life. You can't be in life, in existence, you prefer. And on the outside, looking at it all. But, ah, you're going to bring up that shooting episode, aren't you? The man looking through a microscope, huh? And somewhere between the shadows and the cracks and the molecules, he spies his galaxy, then planet Earth, then himself looking through the microscope, huh? Fantasy, my lad. A hyperactive imagination. Get your act straight. But, Doctor, if you can imagine it, it has already been so, or it will never be so. Stop shouting. There are no ears to hear you. Not unless I decide that there are. That's outside my domain. Yes, Doctor, it is. And if you're tall, you're balding. And if you're balding, you have spectacles. And if you have spectacles, you're American. Do you give lectures by chance on the future of mankind? The future of mankind, my boy, is past and done with. Balderdash, as you English say. What? You heard me. Balderdash. Barbara's smile had broken free, and the candles were jigging. You're putting me on, that's what. I was back in the picture. Thank God. I, 
I admit it, Barbara. It, um, <clears throat> it was one of my shock statements designed to... Well, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm the um, Hamlet who always wanted to play the clown. <laughs> it, it never works. Well, never mind, dear. You can't be everything. I can't be everything. I can only be something. Wait, though. If I can be something, I can be everything. I'm the identifier. Get hold of yourself. Everything is simply a word. Why make such a big thing around it? Simply a word. Eeny, meeny, meeny, my mo. Let R out to go. Anything. Well, the least of the thing is to do that. How would you like to hear a joke, Barbara? I thought that was a problem area for you. Let me give it a try. Okay, I'm all ears. Well, there was this chap, you see, who went to the doctor and he said, I stopped myself. I'd been merely going to try to lighten the atmosphere by telling that joke, which I never understood, but found pretty funny, and which would have continued with, he said to the doctor as he entered the surgery with a plate of what looked like fish and chips on his head, Doctor, I've come to see you about my brother. But instead, I found myself continuing the tale I was telling Barbara with... And he said to the doctor, Doctor, I've got this problem. Every time I look in the mirror, I can only see the back of my head. And then I stopped dead, because I hadn't the faintest idea of how to go on. I know. Don't tell me. The doctor said, turn the mirror around, you fool. You're looking at it the wrong way. Right? She presumably took my continued silence as a signal to try again. Um, the doctor said, how can you expect it to be otherwise if you stand with your back to it? I shook my head. Okay. I give up. So do I. What do you mean? I mean, Barbara, count me out. Did that lecture depress you, perchance? And you? She looked at me directly without speaking. And what am I supposed to do about that? I asked. Had I whined? I don't know, she said, still not averting her eyes. But I think you... I think you could... You don't mean do something about our depression, of course. No, she was no longer looking at me. You mean the... the issue? Yes, Joseph. The issue. Harry Hudson invited me to his birthday party. Being a Eurasian, he had once confided in me, is no easy matter in Singapore. But since I'd heard mumblings from Malays, those damn Chinese are everywhere, and Chinese, those damn Malays are so lazy, and Tamils, those damn Chinese and those damn Malays think we're all damn thieves, I did not grace Harry's bemoaning with a great deal of attention. For a Eurasian who was having such a hard time of it, Harry Hudson was doing pretty well. You only had to get inside his house to see that. The dimensions of the living room, for example, were luxurious. I'd arrived later than everyone else, apparently, for Harry told me right away that he wasn't expecting anyone after me, and that instead of introducing me in person to one and all, he'd give me the lowdown on most of them. His commentary was amusing, but not very kind. <laughs> For instance, Richard Loon was an assistant department chief whose moods, Harry simpered, alternated between great geniality and long bouts of henpecking, uh, depending on whether or not his boss, and uh, Harry steered my gaze to another part of the sumptuous living room, had been uh, sitting on him lately. His boss, B.G. Chu, was on a colossal ego trip, he was supposed to be a department head, but as everyone knew, except him, he was capable of managing nothing whatsoever, including his personnel. He had, however, American connections, and, and so on and so on. One by one, he picked them off, the men, the women, and the neither one nor the other. And uh, 
What do they say about Harry Hudson? I ventured. He was amused. A good for nothing layabout and armchair critic. Are you really that? Oh, I think so, he said without apparent embarrassment. I've been lucky, in spite of your hard time as a Eurasian. A malicious laugh from him, and then, <laughs> because of it, because of it, my friend, I raised my glass. Here's to hard times. There's something to be said for them. Ah, he interrupted himself. Let's see what our good Mr. Freddy Velou is up to. He led me over to the media area, where a portly, somewhat self-satisfied man of, I supposed, Indian extraction, was holding court. The subject I could hear now was hypnosis. It had got to the crucial stage, evidently, for he was asking for a volunteer, a luscious young lady, Malay, in the small circle, responded. Freddy Velou looked her over. I cannot do it unless you're truly a volunteer, he said. I accept, she replied simply. I need more than that. I need your absolute cooperation. Uh, I'm afraid I have forgotten your name. Irene Panicott. Very well, Irene. Please sit in front of me and fix your eyes on an object, any object in the room, slightly above eye level. Within three or four minutes, she was under. Velou, seeing he'd got hold of quite an audience, raised his voice a little. I once hypnotized a girl in England, and I asked some of her friends from the same village to propose something I could get her to do. One of them suggested we get her to ride one of the cows in the nearby field. I asked her if she would, and to my surprise, she refused. I asked her why, and you know what she replied. She said, no, I couldn't. It would turn the milk sour. <laughs> he allowed the gathering to digest this before continuing. But uh, now we can try something more interesting. Irene, he turned to her, in a moment I want you to walk across the room to the French doors. You will have your eyes open, but as you will see, there will be no obstacle in your path. Understood? Irene nodded. Open your eyes, please. She did so. Uh, on kin. Velou spoke to a young man in a red check shirt. Please uh, place a chair directly in her path. Ong Kin moved one from where he was standing, directly between Irene Panicott and the French doors, although there was space around it, if she wanted to avoid it. Valou instructed Irene to walk, as agreed. Without hesitation, she started across the room and then bumped right into the chair. Without even a blink, she merely stepped around it and continued her walk, arriving at the French doors. Valou moved to the chair and spoke to her. You're going to wake up on the count of three, Irene, but before you do, remember that this chair has ceased to have any existence. It does not exist. Do you understand? I do, she said with a composure that made me wonder for an instant if the whole thing had been arranged between them. Mm, but I, I didn't think it likely. One, two, three. She awoke almost imperceptibly, and Velou immediately asked her how she felt. Fine, she smiled at him. Well, I, I want to thank you, Irene. Tell me, do you remember everything? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, would you like to come and sit over here for a moment? Velou indicated the chair in the middle of the room. She walked over to him. Uh, you mean... Um, on the floor? she asked. Uh, no, on this chair, Irene. She smiled again, but this time cheekily. Why this particular chair? I was almost embarrassed on Velu's behalf. It didn't look too good. Why not this particular chair? Velu asked, mirroring her smile. I could see that a couple of the onlookers were uneasy. Irene said, I thought the hypnosis game had finished. And then with exaggerated pleasantness. But I shall imagine a chair, if you wish, and pretend to sit on it, if it pleases you. A stunning lady, Eurasian, in her thirties, in an even more striking sari 
lightly rustled to the centre of the room. She clasped the chair. Irene, she said, fixing the girl's eyes with her own. Don't you see the chair? Irene laughed. <laughs> so, Lily, you're in it also. Lily, who I remembered had been described to me by Harry as a disoriented oriental, placed Irene's hand on the backrest of the chair. Feel it, Irene, she said. Irene Panicott seemed to tire of the game. No, Lily, she reproached her lightly. You know, and I know, and everyone else in the room knows that there is neither chair nor anything else here. So, you mean you can't, you really can't? A young Chinese in corduroys and a flowered shirt began incredulously, then seeing that everyone had turned towards him, he stopped himself. Velu discreetly signalled to the others that they should disperse and that the chair should be left where it was. A more or less willing return to the normality of the party followed. But it was quite evident to me, and no doubt to others, that the chair in question did not exist for Irene. The query in my mind was, would it exist for her tomorrow, or next month? Also, I wondered, suppose that same chair were simply put among others round, say, an eating table, and we were all sitting down at it, then would that chair still not exist for her? I, I chose a good moment and then approached Velou with the question. He was pleased at my interest in the subject. A fascinating thought. I haven't gone further with this so far because I'm aware that one is thus entering the complex area of, shall we say, existential philosophy. For instance, does the chair that does not exist for Irene only not exist in one specific context, i.e. in one part of a particular room, in one particular set of circumstances, or does that very chair not exist for her? And how do you identify something which does not exist? Velu's eyes seemed to have expanded. They were almost as large as his spectacle frames. I was reminded of the little boy in Emil and the Detective, who'd been offered a drugged sweet by a man in a train. And as the sweet had begun to take effect, Emil fancied that the man's eyes were protruding through the newspaper behind which he had concealed himself. Velu had apparently resolved his argument. On second thoughts, he went on, his eyes unblinkingly on mine, I'm inclined to believe that if we placed that particular chair at the dining table and invited Irene to sit down, the chair in question would then exist for her, which means, therefore, that I couldn't pull back from Velu's stare. I was aware that others had gathered around the two of us, which means that existence has no being except in the mind, mind of, of the viewer. viewer. But Velu had not said that. I thought I'd heard his voice, but his lips had not moved. I must have drunk more than I thought, or perhaps faster than I had imagined. I wasn't a big drinker at the best of times. Hmm. Yes, that had to be it. That was why I... I couldn't turn my head away from Baloo to see what the others were so interested in. Surely not this rather philosophical dialogue. I think Baloo was issuing instructions now, but I, I couldn't really follow the words. I remembered that I was the only European at this party. <laughs> there wasn't even an Australian. There couldn't... Could there be some kind of a drug game, or worse, an LSD caper going on, a sort of joke at the ex-colonial's expense, maybe, where Singaporeans so self-controlled, so polite, so reticent as they appeared to be. Was this a future city island paradise? Or could there be a malevolent substructure which they all knew about, but we could not have suspected? Velu's voices had a chant about them now, as I heard 
Opposite. The opposite of presence is absence. Presence is presence. Presence is presence. Absence is absence. But absence does not explain absence. It seemed to me that we were playing a game, and the others had formed a circle about me. I thought they were incanting, or maybe they had a record on. I blinked, and then in that space of a blink, Velu had somehow managed to step out of my vision. The curious thing was, I could not remove my eyes from where his face had been, so I still could not see what the circle was up to. I wanted to know. Take a letter from a word. What remains is absurd. But if the chair that isn't there really isn't there, there was no doubt about it. They were making fun of me. I trusted it was harmless fun. I tried to keep it light by executing a little dance in the hope that they would perceive me as inoffensive. It seemed to please them. They hummed a bit now, in unison. I felt there was a chance. I skipped about, and they didn't seem to mind. We rose and fell as one, a breathing breast in a body of moon down. Hands led me to a halter and gently locked me in. I didn't seem to mind. And if this were sleep, I mused, and things were not so bad. They were playing, so childlike, these Asians. We colonials <laughs> were so heavy, so gross, but they were so light that they floated through their lives, then drifted leaf-like to death. We heavies, we shoved against it, all the way to the last belch and vomit. Who told us how to live, one? Tell us how to die. Was I robed? Their leader? Shackled? Was I their plaything? We were all robed, it appeared, for now I could see them. I can't say I recognized any of their faces, but at least I was part of the circle. I had been accepted. We were robed in pale green. Before each one of us was a small table. A voice, I couldn't tell whose, said, Game. Another said, Guessing game. All members of the circle turned to me. Guess what we are doing. In identical unison, four fingers of each right hand, Five, four, three, two, five, four, three, two, including mine, drummed on tables. So guess what we're doing, someone said. What were we doing? It was a charade then. Oh, very well. We were sitting, waiting for... for a train? The assembly shook its head negatively. Waiting for a speaker to begin? Negative. Try something more abstract, perhaps. Waiting for things... To get better. Negative. All right. I give up. We all stood, still drumming. And together we sang. Four per second, four per second. It's raining flesh, it's raining bones, a deluge of tissues, it's sinews of glands, bevy of bodies, holocaust of hands. At last I was enjoying myself. It was good to be a part of it all. Four per second, second, four per four second, second. noose the earth, earth, bleed the air, gut the sky, sky. Exfixiate, exfixiate the globe the with a stinking the skin, skin and watch it die. Four billion and one, five billion and one, six six billion and one, four billion and one, five billion and one, six six billion and one. And with one accord. There we will shall, shall not done. be done. It was over. After only having been at NPB for a couple of weeks, I'd stormed into the top man to complain about unprofessional conditions and an impossible personnel situation. 
I was instantly accused of rebel rousing and trying for the job of executive director. A contract was a contract, he had said, and that was that. I found myself hoisted on my own petard. For years I devotedly believed in the principle that, given a choice between a vile human despot on the one hand and on the other a mass monster, i.e. union, mob, club, clique, computerization, and so on, I would take the former. And here, in the flesh, was the former. My hypothesis had been that in the case of the former, you could change his mind by uh, A, sticking precisely to the deal between you, and B, showing him that regardless of your feelings for him and his, you wouldn't join in with the run-him-down chorus. Whereas in the latter, there was no individual mind to change. You were destined to remain an ever-complaining eel in the barrel of eels. Hence my plan to go it alone. My realigning of working hours, my non-usage of available personnel, and so forth. But actually, I rather liked Singaporeans. In particular, I liked some of the video centre's personnel. And on a certain Monday morning, I suppose I simply had a yen to chew the fat with some of them. So I did not pack up and leave just as they arrived, for once. Just by chance, I'd picked the right day. There was an inauguration of something or other going on, and the executive director, known, by the way, as The Man, plus almost all the upper hierarchy, uh, referred to as The Seals, would be absent all day long. This was one of the rarest of occasions at NPB, when a number of people were able to assemble in one place and at one time, and <laughs> chat. So we did. And very pleasant it was. At one point, they asked to see the logo, and I ran it for them. Apparently, it inspired Lim Chin Siang, a true live wire, whatever there was one, to rope in Philip Tan and William Wong to try some chroma key experiments, during which Chin Siang asked me if I had an unusual looking diagram or photo they could use. I had, in fact, it was a coloured drawing of a cell, magnified 20,000 times, showing the uh, structures visible under an electron microscope. Well, everyone joined in the fun, even sedate Betty Liu, who had previously poo-pooed any kind of frivolity. We fiddled with the time base corrector, we patched and repatched, we tried everything with eyes open and closed. The results were certainly amusing. We decided to call in other members of staff to show them our nightmarish animations. Oh, there was much ooing and eyeing, especially the latter, and who knows, perhaps a, a greater respect for some of the mysterious talent of the video centre staff. The attitude towards the centre had indeed either been that of indifference or of animosity until now. Staff members were asked to guess what it was, and finally, when they had utterly failed to identify the curious monstrosities jiggling in front of them on the monitor, they were shown the original electron microscope diagram. Ah, they responded when they saw the source, and departed chattering happily, one would like to think, but more probably asking themselves and each other why video centre personnel were able to play all day long when they had to do boring work all day long. But, but, why the ah? Ah, what? At 6.45 p.m. everyone had gone. I'd enjoyed the day and was getting ready to settle down to some serious pre-editing work on scenes shot at General Motors. I smoked a pipe and uh, sipped some coffee in the studio, <laughs> sacrilege, and gazed at the anatomy of a cell. Twenty thousand times. <laughs> and apparently the electron microscope could magnify cells up to half a million times. Half a million. <laughs> what was half a million? Hmm. Uh, Sixty seconds per minute, three thousand six hundred seconds per hour. Uh, 
86,400 per day. So, if one counted an average of uh, one number per second without stopping to eat or sleep or anything else, one would arrive at uh, half a million in uh, give or take five and three quarter days. <laughs> yeah. oh, all right. Well, that was manageable. But what about if we uh, if we if we upped the ante a bit? People were always talking in billions. So, how long would it take to count to half a billion or five hundred a million American style? <laughs> Fifteen years. Hmm. So. Uh, if there were billions of stars, some of which were millions of times the size of our sun, which um, 10,000 million years before its extinction was travelling at half a million miles per day towards a constellation called Hercules, which wouldn't be there at all by the time we arrived, and if it already would take uh, 1,234,567,893,456 123,456 days uh, to cross but one of the millions of galaxies in our most powerful rockets, what in blazes had any of this to do with reality? Another glance. There were three eye-type protrusions on its forehead. Here and there were bits and pieces of Debris. The, the whole thing was encased in this uh, globular skin of an indeterminately uh, bluish colour. <laughs> well, of course, I didn't have to look through a half million times or a two hundred million times microscope to know what I would find, did I? I should finally find everything reduced to its commonest denominator, shouldn't I? But what could the common denominator be? Surely it would have to be shapeless, formless, endless, beginningless. In a word, nothing. Hmm. So far, so good. Except for one thing. Nothing was what? As the thought question phrased itself, my nightmare began again. I could not shake myself free of it, as I could of any part of any dream I detested. The cellular structure quivered, dissipated, reformed into the visual vice of the man at the party, Valu. There was only one eye whose bloodshot suckers were drawing me in towards its nuclear furnace. I became the burning, but knew no pain, blinded, stunned in an electric grip, and slapped into that boiling core I was myself. Light. I could not have breathed. I could not have lived. The outer reaches of that furnace paled and thinned, translucent. Now they offered me a hope, those schemes, a hope for after, for beyond, for explanation. But I now saw the shadow of a black sun, that dark orb rising, that faceless 
fungus sprouting its rude cluster was loathsomely familiar to me. Alas, I knew the face that lay upon its other side. We crept up, you and I, idiots both. Dollied in we were. <laughs> Agog we were, you and I, at first. But then we knew, didn't we? That hairy patch with middle-aged peeping pink at its tip. And onwards, in and down and left and round to view its pithy face squinting through tear-bubbled eyes at its own wretched crown. Oh, doctor, doctor, every time I look in the mirror, I can only see the back of my head. What shall I do? Die, you fool. If you do not yet know that the world is round, the galaxy is round, existence, all is round, then die. Not all, please, doctor. Not all. All. Fool. All. But why? Why? Why, you gibbering dolt? Because you could not leave well alone. You ate your eaters, destroyed your destroyers, denuded your gods, defiled your unknown. You entered the universe of the bankrupt. You are the eternal bereft. You spin forever in the cycle of the damned. You craved ends to your beginnings. You desired to know the end and the beginning. With all your sophisticated quests and discoveries, you could not see that a straight line could only ever be a circle. That end and beginning were born of word. Your word, fool. Yours. Doctor, doctor, I do not understand. You poor cretin. But I beg you, doctor, I beg you. Just, just one answer. What? Another answer. Yet another. Another. Just one more, and then never again. One more only. But there's always just one more. What do you imagine could satisfy you? Just the one. Listen, you putrid blob of existential excrement. I'll open your last Pandora's box. And I'll do it once, never again. And I will not repeat myself, however much you whine. You're not understanding at me. Now listen for once and for all. Serotonin? Possibly. LSD molecules with radioactive tagging uh, then monitor where they block out the serotonin. And what about the pineal? Well, let's put Martin onto that, shall we? Doctors Stefan Korputkin, MB, FRCP, Psych, FRCP, DCH, consultant psychiatrist, and Walter Feinberg, MD formerly physician in charge of the metabolic research unit of a New York hospital, I'm told, are mulling over the case of Joseph Marcel, who was admitted to the clinic 18 weeks ago. <laughs> I suppose you're going to ask me where the clinic is. Well, I have tried to find out, but I must say, I have it all rather well planned. Firstly, there's such a mixture of nationalities here that the only thing you know, having added climatic and scenic factors together, is that it's not in North America, and it's probably in Central Europe. Joseph has endured three treatments of electroconvulsive therapy, which, please don't misunderstand anything here, uh, he volunteered for. Uh, this therapy apparently accelerates the response to antipsychotic drugs, which, uh, by the way, uh, Joseph might have to take for the rest of his days. It should be mentioned that Feinberg ordered brain scans and so on in order to determine whether or not there was either a vitamin B12 deficiency factor or 
uh, a presumed metabolic disorder such as carcinoma of a vital organ. And Feinberg had suggested that the uh, clean-cut psychological stress of the patient pointed in the direction of organic disease. Korputkin speaks. Anyway, the net result, Walter, seems to be no cerebral tumors or other head injury, no vitamin deficiency, and neither fat embolism nor lobe epilepsy. And general paresis has been ruled out. Right? Feinberg flicks the hem of his white coat down and leans forward in his seat. Although there is no one close to them, the coffee lounge seldom being crowded at 11.30 in the morning, some of his associates seem to find their colleagues' cases more interesting than their own. Stefan, I've got a feeling, a notion, that is, about this war. The diencephalic ischemic state. Korputkin nibbles a nail. But wouldn't that involve cerebral neoplasms, abscess, or subdural hematoma? Normally, yes. The word normally appears to amuse Korputkin. And I think, Feinberg continues, I think we should try a new tack. High-potency multiple vitamins and phenothiazines, intramuscular, after chewing it over for a moment, Korputkin says, Let's put it to Simeone. Feinberg nods, and they finish their coffees in silence. But Feinberg has an uneasy feeling about Marcel. He can't nail it down. They're about to leave for Simeone's office. He's a nice chap, Simeone, always ready with a smile, unlike Korputkin or Feinberg. Oh, they're dedicated, all right, but it's also funereal with them. Ah, well, they're off now, along the second-floor corridor, east wing. It's pretty big, this place. I've got lost at least half a dozen times while trying to get back to Joseph's little room. And then there's this uh, electronic surveillance business. You can't pass through a door without being picked up. <laughs> They've got them in the toilets. Ah, this is the one. Arturo Simeone, M.D., Ph.D., I heard that uh, before coming to this clinic, he was the director of a neurological research laboratory. Hmm. Korputkin speaks to the slats at eye level. Art, Stefan and Walter here. Are you free? A high-pitched pip, and the door swings inwards. Simeone smiles at Korputkin and greets Feinberg. They move to easy chairs in a corner of Simeone's office, away from his desk. Simeone says, I'd better tell you that Marcel is classified as a P3. Korpurkin grunts, P3? We haven't had one of those since... He looks at Feinberg. Yeah, Feinberg draws, since the Yugoslav. <laughs> is there anything political going on? Simeone grins. When isn't there anything political going on? I've decided to leave Simeone's office right away to tell Joseph that he's a P3, whatever that may be. I'm always on the lookout, of course, for the smallest detail that might lead to finding a way of getting Joseph out of here. Oh, yes, I, I know the chances are pretty slim. He's pretty depressed right now. Those drugs don't help. He can't articulate properly. And he spends most of his leisure hours, if you can call them that, playing chess with himself. He certainly doesn't have much time for me. Ah, and we had such plans. Well, here I am back in his room with its anti-bruise furnishings and its eye pry in the ceiling, plus microphone. Everything is relayed, by the way, to a video switchboard system run by an ex-member of the French Sûreté, Jacques Garot, who also once worked for Berlitz in Montreal. But Monsieur Gault can't hear Joseph and me, however hard he tries. Joseph seems to have been writing this time instead of playing chess. Eh, you could say that he's adapted himself pretty well to all this business. He has shown, as they say, remarkable forbearance. Judging by the discarded scraps of paper on the floor, 
He's been working quite hard. Let's see, what's the encircled part in the centre of this page he's writing out? E equals V. Hmm. I'll ask him about it. Joseph, what's this? A formula. A formula for uh, what? What do you think? A cheeky grimace from him to me. I give up. Tell me. No. Try harder. Come on, Joseph. We don't have any secrets from each other. What does E equals V mean? You'll have to try harder. I put a lot of effort coming up with that. So why not you too? I don't answer him because I'm thinking about the ceiling scanner. Suppose what's on that paper interests them. Uh, Joseph, um, I'm popping over to the switchboard. See you soon. But he's already back with his scribblings. I'd better get moving. Have a look at Jarolt and company. Just in case Joseph's frivolity has attracted their serious attention. Ah, down to level one and over to the extreme end of the west wing where Geralt and his crew keep a fatherly eye on all and sundry. Well, there he is, in earnest dialogue with two men I haven't seen before. You would think there was some kind of a panic on judging by Geralt's gesticulations at a video replay which they're feeding through a mini-monitor. <laughs> oh, well, well, what do you know? It's Joseph's formula. They... <laughs> it's got them all upside down. Well, they've put it into freeze now, and Geralt has overlaid the monitor screen with an enlarger. There it is. E equals V. <laughs> the three of them are gabbling away in French. Can't follow too much, of course. The gist seems to be that they've got to refer it to higher up, I think. The shorter of the two men has grabbed the tape now and is scurrying along the corridor, followed by the other man. They turn right down the stairs just before the central elevators, arriving at level minus one, as the sign indicates. It seems that the higher ups are um, lower down. Immediately opposite the steps, there is an unmarked door. Ah, the shorter man stands before it, raises his left hand, palm towards a, a left panel. Uh, a minute aperture in the panel emits an almost imperceptible flash. And the door opens inwards. We're in a rather plush office, carpeted throughout with an array of flowers and plants and a sizable wall aquarium, presumably to compensate for the absence of windows. Wordlessly, a petite, warm-featured woman with honey-blonde hair, in her mid-twenties, inserts the videotape in a desk player. There's a monitor and a high stand in one corner of the office. We see the replay, and she presses the pause at a reasonable shot of the E equals V inscription. She still hasn't spoken to anyone. She frowns as she gazes at the freeze after adjusting the framer. She releases pause, rewinds, replays, and freezes again. She uses the framer, inching one frame after the other, the frown begins to bother me. She walks around to her desk and is about to open the black filing cabinet behind it. Turning to the men, she dismisses them with a smile and uh, merci. The taller of the two says, Je vous en prie, madame. Both men wait at the door for the woman to activate it, which she does by manipulating her wristwatch. Once the men have gone, she goes back to the player and repeats the process of reviewing the tape and freezing it. There it is again. She says it quite loudly, as though not only to herself. I feel this could mean problems for Joseph. She replays it. Having stopped the player, she sits at the desk, right elbow on blotter, thumb supporting chin, left hand on hip. After a moment, she presses play, sets pause, frames, and then, reaching into a left-hand drawer, extracts patch cables which she jacks to a computer on a small trolley close to the filing cabinet. Now she connects what appears to be some sort of an equaliser, which she digs out of the bottom left-hand drawer of her desk and places next to the player. She fiddles with the equaliser parts, feeds figure work into the computer, scribbles. It's obviously going to take a long time. I settle back for a boring wait. 
She repeats all of the actions four, five, sometimes a dozen times before each calculation. She is frequently furious with the computer and sometimes goes and puts her nose right up against the monitor and squints at it before continuing. Finally, she contemplates with some distaste what she has circled on her desk pad. M equals 3 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 10, M, and then underneath that, three question marks, E equals V, followed by three question marks. I'm really amazed that this lot haven't managed to work out as I did. Once Joseph had prodded me into it, it's true, but that E equals V merely means existence equals vocabulary. Rather pathetic, actually, when you consider that with all their resources, they can't get any nearer than computing the size of a molecule. They don't see that it's just moving further and further into the trap. Still, I suppose that if I were any of them, that's what I'd do. After all, the trap you know is better than the trap you don't. The burning question is, however, if Joseph tells them what E equals V means, if he explains it to them, what will they do with the information? One would say that being a P3 can have its perks and compensations. Joseph not only has a new room with French windows, but 30 feet by 10 of grass, and right smack in the middle of it, a tree of his own. He's able to tend the flowers circling the base of the tree for which trowel, fork, and so forth have been provided. He can sit out there and contemplate his tree whenever he wishes. Of course, I'm waiting for you to ask me about the wall. Yes, it's high, true, but there's nothing gloomy about the place. Joseph's universe is well-lighted, thank you. Besides which, I don't think he's in the mood for much of the outside world as it stands right now. I would say he's had enough of the confusion. Perhaps you don't feel the confusion as we do. Possibly for you the world's a fine place and everything has structure and purpose. Or if it's not a fine place, then maybe you tell yourself that as it's all you've got, you'd better just put up with it. Well, not so for Joseph and me. We've discovered something else. Shall we call it pro-world? Hmm, why not? Pro-world is where the the impossible marriage takes place. Imagination and reality. They blend and become one. Loosely put, this means that whatever you wish in pro-world comes true. Fairy tales? From your point of view, probably, yes. Or do you simply call it madness? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. We feel the same about the world we have left behind. I know. You're going to tell me that but for the leniency of the clinic's director, uh, we shouldn't be able to laze around and indulge in our pro-world. Not so. There would be differences, true, but only insofar as the need to find food is concerned. Provided we obtained the basic necessities, we could go on just as we are now. Surely this pro-world idea isn't so strange to you, is it? Have you forgotten your childhood so quickly? Don't you remember how much time you spent imagining? In fact, wasn't that a, a major part of our playtime, whether alone or with others? Imagining? So who dares say that there's anything wrong with the idea of leaving the great family to its own devices? Of quitting the universal mafia? Who says one is obliged to continue running the gauntlet of savages, liars, uh, bigots and derelicts whom one must emulate in order to remain in the game? Who says there's anything palatable about the notion of living a life 
dodging the bombs of planetary pollution, the garrote of proliferating bureaucracy, the daily plague of spanking new skulls. Oh, sorry, I'm digressing. I was telling you about pro-world. Oh, uh, by the way, it's me speaking to you, because Joseph is extremely busy right now. Oh, oh, did you, did you think we were one and the same? Well, whichever way you want. If you crane your neck a little, you can see him kneeling by his flower bed. He's tending the flowers and muttering away. The muttering? Well, he calls it his prayer corner. He mutters there every day. I was saying about your world and pro-world, wasn't I? Well, in your world, the body uh, gets in the way of your achieving whatever you want, doesn't it? In ours, it doesn't do anything of the kind. The body has only one function, which it fulfills rather tediously, I must say, but one can't change everything overnight. And that function is to feed the brain so that it can do what it wants. Otherwise, provided some sorts of victuals keep coming, the body simply ingests, distributes, and excretes the surplus. But should victuals not keep coming, naturally the body would go out and look for them. Uh, apart from that, it doesn't have to do a thing in pro-world. Now, Doctor, I'd like to make it clear to you that we're not greedy. We could easily opt for a, for a Maharaja's palace, a, a drove of slaves, a, a garden of smiles, an ocean of honey. We could milk the moon, cull the stars, or we could refashion the divine and dwell in devoted exultancy. But we know, of course... Mm. Ah, that greed must always be greedy enough for more. Greed must not be satiated. The disease of desire must not be cured. Fulfillment is already a bad enough end to it. But a cure would be disastrous, wouldn't it? Not uh, immortality, but the immortality of passion. Now, wouldn't that be ducky? Well, when you know you can create whatever you wish, it's very heady at first. You have to keep a tight rein. Oh, I know, Doctor, you're going to tell me that this is withdrawal. But you will, I hope, be generous enough to allow me to call it exit instead. Hmm? Of course, your world is so fixed, so firm, that you can't really indulge me to that extent, can you? Exit equals death, does it not? So you're allocating Joseph to a sort of halfway house called withdrawal. Even total withdrawal, aren't you? I can't blame you. One can hardly learn this is a table and at the same time this is not a table, can one? It would be a mockery from any point of view. We understand this. For instance, could you permit Joseph's kind of happiness? Will you agree that he is content? Will you let him be? We doubt it. We're awaiting your scalpel, you know. We just can't believe you will be magnanimous. When, for example, did you meet anyone who did not, even in some small measure, disapprove of something in someone else? Have you run across anyone in your life about whom you could say with certitude he or she did not want to change anything about another or another's way of life? Change it to what? To something resembling, or better, duplicating, something with which one is familiar, right? A consolidation. Only if it is repeated sufficiently does it exist. For you, Mozart's music exists independently, doesn't it? Mozart is always there. And should you learn that we were all to wipe ourselves out tomorrow, you'd assert without a quiver that Mozart's music would remain, right? You'd embrace Einstein's theory of relativity, or perhaps anyone else's theory of any other relativity, but you wouldn't allow any theory to pollute your immutable little formula. Is equals is. And that's that. Would you? I mean, if you did, 
then your own sanity could be called into question, couldn't it? Well, forgive me for claiming the right to disagree. You see, we didn't abandon our old skin once we had entered pro-world. Instead, we opted for a new perspective of what we had left behind. Joseph said that we didn't have to invent, say, a three-eared rabbit. We could look at a two-eared rabbit differently. We could create a new focus. And instead of being confused by so many angles at once, the naked eye angle, the microscopic angle, the biochemical angle, the metaphysical angle, and so on, which all becomes very depressing after a while, we should agree on multiple realities. Thus, we could truly expand our universe. Multiple realities, imagine. In other words, his contention is that despite his calamitous creation, as Joseph calls the world, it is redeemable. Divinely patronizing, did I hear you say? Well, the answer to that is, I should hope so. Aha, I can see you grimacing in distaste. And I sympathize. Why should you take Joseph's word for it, that reality as you know it does not exist, and that only multiple realities can possibly qualify you for a homo sapiens diploma? Not that that makes it exist any the more, but at least it's an act of heresy. To take but one instance, I prize myself away from the icy horizon of space, intergalactic travel, intramicroscopular, my word, exploration, etc., etc., which, by the way, only leads one to the back of his skull, and redefine. I hear you asking how and why, uh, skeptically, no doubt, man with good reason. But anyway, I have to answer you by saying this. If matter exists independently of humanity, then whatever brought about its being must be humanly capable of seeing it and describing it. Otherwise it cannot be. In other words, not a thing can be without someone to perceive it. I receptively compose Bach's music in order for Bach's music to have been composed. The circle is closed. But a circle can only exist in a space. Space is a word. It cannot be heard without being spoken. It cannot be spoken without being heard. It cannot be conceived of without a conceiver. Conceiver is a word which is evocable, emitted by that which conceives of itself as being that entity. Ah, I can tell you've had enough. Yeah, you look very businesslike. <clears throat> You wish to see Joseph, Doctor? Of course, sir. And then you'll make a decision, I suppose. Well, if I were the Doctor, I would doubtless arrive at the same conclusion. But at least you can comprehend how Joseph must have suffered in his previous world, can't you? You can sympathize with that, surely. He didn't mean any harm. I mean, look at him there, Doctor, kneeling before his flower bed. Oh, yes, he goes through that every day. Well, he gets down on his prayer mat, as he calls it, faces his tree, um, tends his plants, or fiddles with the earth, rolling and kneading it between his fingers like an Arab's worry beads, and uh, he's off. Listen. Just listen to the babbling. You're not going to tell me that all that nonsense is causing anyone any bother. Oh, come on now, be persuaded. Need he be seen as any more than an unfortunate specimen groveling in front of his nonsense tree and spouting his nonsense? Be convinced. A little closer. Hear it. O oh, tree of existence, listen to me. Listen to the greatest cretin in creation. I have desecrated my creation. I have worshipped need, I have taught myself want, not have, purpose, not delight. I long for other, not here, for then, not now. I have banished the infant of me, I have degraded each loved one, betrayed every principle, 
I have become invincible. I have contrived ambushes, instigated machinations, concocted artifices. My explanations have always absolved me. I have preached conscience and practiced ruse, preached sincerity, practiced perjury, preached altruism, practiced self-love. I have dishonored my existence. I have not taught myself to adore. To adore my day of life. Uh, I think he's going to start mumbling now. Kiss of stillness, balm of night. Yes, we might as well leave. Sheen of light, I, dwarf, have dwarfed the plains, the hills, the skies, outrun the rivers, outbred the oceans, but I, giant, cannot subdue the void, for I am that void. Come now, doctor, a pinch of magnanimity. He is his own worst enemy. He is a thing. He can neither live in one world nor another. Must you have his scalp? It's a nothing scalp, doctor. He is literally of no earthly use. So why not leave him harmlessly in his little walled garden? It would be an exaggeration to take this whole thing too seriously. It is, after all, a case of, <laughs> of self-inflicted damage. I mean, he started it. Ah, you look very businesslike again. You think you can help him, don't you? No, no, there's no need to take what I said earlier with anything other than a grain of salt. I was appealing to your fair play, that's all. I mean that uh, pro-world business. It was only to convince you of the intractability, the, the, the immutability of your charge. <laughs> be, be reasonable, Doctor. Does it make any difference to you that one philosophy or another is a la mode or, or even prevails? Why make such a big thing out of what's sane and what isn't? Will it affect the fee structure? I, I hope you're not offended, but... Frankly, isn't the belly the center of the universe? And once it's filled, aren't we carrying things a little too far to quibble over perspectives? Save a life by all means, but spare a horizon. Don't debase yourself by waging war on the heathen. All right, all right, all right. I'll put it in more precise language. Do you know, Doctor, that... Well, do you know what the definition of Esperanto is? Listen, Esperanto, the, the definition, it is an artificial, universal language. Now, look at artificial in your dictionary, uh, right? Uh, it, it will say man-made, not natural or real. Uh, tell me, Doctor, if Esperanto is a, is a not natural but man-made language, well, what is English or Mandarin? <laughs> Are they natural? Are they other than man-made? What is the difference between real and artificial? Speed of acquisition? Then thumbs down for the modern era. What is the difference between Joseph's world and yours? Are not Esperanto or Ido or, or Interglossa or Volapük based on other languages? Is not pro-world based on world? Do you condemn it so readily in the name of what? Let me go further, Doctor. Do you really think that Joseph and I have long dialogues about how we're not here and how there is no here and how it is not all illusion? For if it were, someone would have to be having the illusion. Why, Doctor, if right now I say to you, there is no here, there never was and never could have been a here, an existence, a word, a nothingness. I would consider myself a candidate for the same institution as Joseph's. It's crazy talk. You see, I need to be here in order to say that I'm not here, don't I? And how on earth can that be? 
Madness, eh? Well, actually, no, Doctor. What about nonsense? You see, Joseph knows his nonsense tree. That is, he knows it is a nonsense tree. And that's the big one, Doctor. He knows that there can be no tree. He is no longer sustained by any form of illusion. Illusion, at best, is a very poor sustenance for the human psyche. The basis of human malaise is, at its lowest level, the sensation that something is amiss. At a higher level of consciousness, it is a belief that he is either somehow being duped, or that he is somehow duping himself. But the question, why are we here, has no answer, of course, because the answer is in the question. The record that man makes of his beings and doings is a record written in no reality whatsoever. He must allow the delusion that has a record is being made. It happened. It is quite absurd for him to see himself making a record of something that couldn't have happened, in the sense that he has educated himself to understand happening. And furthermore, to know that there is no he to make a record. At the highest level of consciousness, he cannot stand the notion of there never having been anything at all. He cannot make the switch to an acceptance of the nonsense tree, for he has grown up the other way. He is the product of the other way. What he sees or knows of is, and that's that. The only real goal in Joseph's life, Doctor, was to return to a safe oblivion, babyhood, a return to mindless, all-embracing, gratifying womb. For instance, to glide in a car, a sucker at the lips, a fetal pounding of the ears, a vague kaleidoscope of visual distraction, limbo. Everything in his life was, is, directed towards that. But how can you lead a mindful mind to mindlessness? What drove Joseph to go to the lengths he went to in order to even try to reclaim this happy oblivion? The vision of the oblivion to come, no doubt. The knowledge, however unfocused, of the present situation, the present oblivion. Oh, very well then, if not the knowledge, the subliminal sensation. Come, Doctor, don't you know what I mean? Think of the excruciating pain he caused others in the name of escaping his own. Did he hate others? Never. Only that they were there, in his way, when he didn't want them to be. And never there, when he really needed of them. Think of the subtle schemes Joseph engineered in the workplace. Socially, at home, relegating one here and deposing another there. For what reason, Doctor? For security. Yes, to leave him secure enough to be able to afford to gamble his security. Of course! Do you think you can stop? Stopping, Doctor, is also oblivion. You don't arrive in order to stop. You arrive in order to go on. For how long can you pause? Only for so long as it takes to breathe in and to breathe out. Then you must move. If you stop for longer, you start to see. What do you see? You see what you are looking at. Then through it, then beyond it, to where it cannot be. And then you will know that at and through and beyond and cannot be are one and the same. So you must jolt yourself into action now. Beware of liberty, Doctor. Liberty is a whore. Wait. Wait. I can see there are no means of moving you. You have a hard head. All right. Let me put it another way. I plead. I plead for Joseph's integrity, of which I am part. I plead for the right of man to be what he thinks he is or is not. All right. 
You're frightened. Joseph frightens you. Admit it. Have the courage. He puts you out of joint. You must convert him. If you can't convert him, you must invalidate, eliminate him, right? Or he will eradicate you. Isn't that what you fear, isn't it? Yet, what could be destroyed? Your pride? Your self-righteousness? Your raison d'être? Is it that fragile? Is the floor of your house so hollow? Do men stand after all on an artificial base in artificial space? And you, who have professed through all your ages to have reached for truth, can you not now stand it? Can you not bear that there is no difference between language and artificial language, between truth and artificial truth? Acknowledge it, Doctor. You have never recognized the face you see in your mirror. The face has never been truly known to you. You who so dogmatically press for self-knowledge, self-fruition. Will you stop short of the sum total? Is not the back of your head the honest reflection of your face in the mirror? Your lips are pale. Is it perhaps that you have just seen that this is life after death? that yields the soil, that spawns the eye, that kens the word, I am. <laughs>